Uh, thing, um, office in, um, in the United Nations in, uh, in Geneva. And uh, he invited me, he wanted to interview me. And uh, the interview took place on uh, Monday, which will be September the 18th. Monday, September the 18th, uh, at the press uh, office in the Palais de Nations in Geneva. And uh, we have now the uh, broadcast of that interview for you uh, today here at IBN. Uh, I ask you to kindly listen carefully uh, to the questions being posed by uh, Christian. I hope he visits Trinidad sometime. Christian, if you're listening, uh, listening to us this morning, I hope you'll visit us sometime in Trinidad and meet our people here. But it was a wonderful opportunity for me to be interviewed by a Roman Catholic uh, television station and to offer the viewpoint of Islam on a wide range uh, of subjects uh, pertaining, for example, to eschatology. So we're going to view that uh, video now. And at the end of the video, uh, I will then return to uh, begin my uh, my explanation of what is money in Islam. I have spoken extensively on the current monetary system. I've spoken about the uh, paper money, the monetary system which came out of Bretton Woods. I've spoken about the petrodollar monetary system. I've also spoken about digital or electronic money which is now coming. Uh, and uh, I need to now wrap it up by explaining what is money in Islam, what is money in the Quran, and what is money in the Sunnah. So at the end of today's program, we have a few minutes left to start that explanation, and it will be completed in the following, uh, following broadcast. So here you are now, the interview with Christian Peshken at the Palais de Nation in the United Nations, Geneva, on Monday, September 18. So uh, thank you, Imran, for visiting us here at the United Nations in Geneva, for coming for this interview. You know, I always wanted to ask you um, um, this question. Um, why are you in the eyes of some people, even your own people, even Muslims, um, a sort of controversial figure? What do you think why that is? Um, Christian, first of all, thank you for your kind invitation to be interviewed here. 
the last time we were at the at the restaurant in Geneva um, and this time I'm back home because I used to be a graduate student a PhD student at the uh, Graduate Institute of International Studies around the lake in Geneva there and while I was a PhD student I had access to the UN library so I used to be here at the Palais des Nations a lot of, a lot of time I spent over here so it's like coming back home um, but the world has changed since then it was 40 years ago and now it's a strange new world and those who have eyes and uh, can see with those eyes and that is the essential part of religion to have eyes and to be able to see and perceive the reality of things when we when we recognize the reality of the world today and then we expose its reality and we um, show that it, the appearance and reality are quite different from each other then that's a shock for many people because there are so many in the world today who have eyes and yet cannot see and as a consequence they, are, they respond to me with uh, shock and with discomfort <laughs> um, and that's why there are so many uh, in the world today who have um, this particular attitude towards me but not only to me to all those whether you be Christian or Jew or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim who seek to penetrate the reality of the world today and then to expose that reality we become a people who are probably problematic yes. <laughs> for the rest yes, yes. do you t you refer probably to also to the spiritual eye to the eye you know not to the the uh, eye of man but also the perception you know from a spiritual perspective right the religion of islam is not unique in uh, recognizing that it is the lord god who created us all and who created the human being and when he created the human being he breathed into the human being of his divine spirit as a consequence of which every human being by virtue of being a human being possesses something divine inside of him and her inside of him and her. that which is divine inside of us give us the capacity to see what otherwise cannot be seen and so yes it is a spiritual interpretation of the world and a spiritual interpretation of history which makes us different Imran you you, you led the Friday prayer service at the United Nations not in, in Geneva but in New York for for how many ten years? ten years yeah when you think back what was uh, what was it about what was it, it was about? a very interesting time for me because prior to this I was in the world of books in the academic world but when I went to New York in 1992 and very quickly I was appointed as the director of Islamic studies for the joint committee of Muslim organizations of greater New York that is New York, New Jersey and Connecticut um, the Islamic community of the United Nations was one of 16 organizations which came together to establish this joint committee and I was required to go to the United Nations headquarters in Manhattan once a month on the day of Friday, the day of the, the congregational prayer and uh, the the secretary general gave us the largest hall in the building which was his reception hall for our prayers every every uh, friday every day of juma and uh, i would have to conduct the prayer i'd have to deliver the sermon and uh, there would be delegates from all over the world coming in and out of the un and after the prayer we would go to the cafeteria for lunch and i'd have ch a chance to chat with people from all parts of the world it was a thrilling experience for me. New York at that time was the center of the world 
but the gravity is changing now. New York is no longer <laughs> going to remain the center of the world for long again. And I spent there 10 years, 10 years. It was a very interesting time. It was a learning experience. I, I was able to meet with rabbis for the first time in my life. And, and, and the rabbis were usually very well-educated people. And I had to interact with them, and I'm green to this kind of world. I met with ministers of the Christian faith. Uh, I remember being invited to a conference in upstate New York, uh, um, and there were about 200 Methodist Christian ministers. And I have to make a presentation on Islam, and I'm the only Muslim in the room. And uh, they were challenging me on certain verses of the Quran, and I had to respond, and I was beginning to understand the world afresh. So my stay in New York for those 10 years at the United Nations headquarters in Manhattan uh, was very beneficial for me for understanding the world today. You know, we're talking about religion um, and uh, inter-religious dialogue, interfaith uh, dialogue. What, in your opinion, is, you know, how can we get, uh, you know, all these different religions together that believe in, you know, the one God and um, make them understand that if we unite together, you know, then we are a force against the evil of ungodliness and everything that goes on in the secular world today, right? Christian, it's a good time for the beard to be white. It's a good time to be old. And it's a difficult time to be young. You and I have seen the world change before our eyes, and it's still changing. There is some mysterious transformation taking place before our eyes in the world, and it's not for the better. It is as though the world is decaying, it's rotting. And when we look at the cause of the rotting of the world, we see that there appears to be a war being waged on the religious way of life. The religious way of life delivers stability. Stability in the person, stability in the family, stability in the home, in the society, and in the world. And as the religious way of life is under attack and it crumbles and disintegrates, there is chaos in the world, there is anarchy in the world, and society is collapsing around the world. It's becoming a more and more violent world. It's becoming a world of more tears than smiles. And if you recognize that this is happening in the world today, and you're old enough to be able to have that maturity, what do we do about it? And our first response, Christian, our first response is, it's time for those who live the religious way of life to come together. Religion is based on moral values, on truth. And truth is under attack in the world today. It is with truth that you can recognize falsehood. It is with truth that you can expose falsehood. Religion is based on truth, and truth is based on justice. It is with truth that you can recognize injustice and oppression in the world. And we who live the religious way of life, the Christian, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestants, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Orthodox Christian, the Jew, if a Jew opposes oppression and resists the oppressor, he is my brother. If a Christian does the same, he is my brother as a Muslim. And so it's time enough for us to come together to try to understand the reality of the world today and to devise a common strategy for responding to the challenge that faces us today. Is this um, what you refer to in, from an Islamic view, uh, evil and good and evil, Gog and Magog? Is that what we are talking about? The Christian knows about Gog and Magog. Explain shortly what Gog and yeah. Magog is for those. Gog and Magog are people. And uh, 
they are people who belong to the end time. So it's eschatology. They are created by the Lord God. And they are endowed with power. Irresistible power. But we who follow the religious way of life, we will use power to oppose oppression. And we will use power to liberate the oppressed. And we will use power to assist those who want to live lives of righteousness and piety. But they use power to oppress. And they use power to wage war on the religious way of life. And that's where we are today. Those who are waging war on the religious way of life in the world today, those who are the masters of oppression, are Gog and Magog. Uh, in the world of Islam, we have Gog and Magog. Christianity has it, Judaism has it. Uh, I have written a book entitled an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. Uh, but it's not possible in the brief time that we have uh, to be able to go to the Quran to teach, to, to explain to you. But in a nutshell, look at the world today and you'll see those who control power and are using that power to oppress and are using that power to wage a war on the religious way of life, they are Gog and Magog. Isn't that oppression um, that you are also referring to here pretty much driven by the monetary system, for example? Is that, is that part of the op oppressive? I'm so, happy, I'm so happy that you've asked that question because I forgot something about Gog and Magog. They have PhDs in <laughs> corruption. They corrupt everything that they touch. And... Uh, they corrupt, for example, the human personality, which, which, which is comprised of external sight and internal sight in the human personality. And they corrupt us to such an extent that we have inside of us only darkness, no light. If you have no light inside of you, you cannot see. They corrupt our bedroom life. They corrupt... A woman who is supposed to be a woman, now she is being changed into a man. And the man who is supposed to be a man and fulfill his functions as a man to maintain his family, for example, he now is abandoning that and living more of the feminine way of life. This corruption is taking place everywhere in sports, in education, in the political system, in business, but it is taking place, most dangerous of all, in money. And uh, when Jesus comes back, and the most powerful voice in history to have prophesied that Jesus will return is the voice of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to be using the euro or the USD. <laughs> no. When Jesus comes back, he's going to be using the money that they were using in the temple in Jerusalem. And the Christian has to be reminded, I hope he's not offended by a Muslim reminding him, that when Jesus returns, he's going to be using gold coins and silver coins because the temple minted its own coins in Jerusalem. That is now prohibited by those who control power in the world. You're not allowed to use gold as money. No. And we must resist it, we who live the religious way of life. The corruption of money is the most dangerous problem we face today in the world and in the religious way of life. Would you say with all the things that are happening around us in the past 20, 30 years or more even, that this is really, we, we are living actually really in the last days, so to speak? Is, is this, uh... We most certainly are living in the end time and uh, we are now on the verge of the greatest war of all in history. And I remember Pope Francis meeting with the head of the Orthodox Christian Church. Uh, was it maybe in Havana they met? Maybe a year ago? 
And both of them, the leaders of this side of Christianity and that side of Christianity, both made a declaration warning about the great war which is coming and seeking to try to avoid that great war. I remember that declaration of Pope Francis and Cuba, yes. in Cuba. Uh, that great war is part of the end time. The Christian knows it as Armageddon. The Muslim knows it as the Malhama. And that great war is going to substantially reduce the population of the world. So this is a subject of supreme importance. We are on the verge of it. And uh, it could start in Korea. It could start in Ukraine. But we know the gravity is going to put it to a particular area between Syria and Turkey, where the pieces are being put in place, where the pieces are being put in place for the Great War. We in Islamic eschatology not only know about the Great War, but we know what's going to happen after the Great War. And I was pleasantly surprised to find in Christian eschatology that you also have the same view, that there is going to be a conquest of Constantinople after the Great War. I went to Moscow and I was surprised to find Christian eschatology. Oh, we also have this belief of the conquest of Constantinople after which the Antichrist will appear in person. Constantinople being Istanbul. I don't like the word Istanbul. No, but I mean... Yes. So. I don't like the word Istanbul. I want to recover the word Constantinople. When our prophet referred to that city, he used the name Constantinople. And when we liberate that city, we will recover the name of Constantinople, number one. Number two, we will apologize to the Christian world we will apologize to the Christian world for what the Ottoman Empire did. When they conquered the city, they took the largest Christian cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, which had been a cathedral for 1,000 years, and they sinfully and disgracefully and maliciously transformed it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam. So we will restore it. It is your church. It is your cathedral. And apologize to the Christian world. Let's talk for a second about um, Pope Francis. What is your view on this pope, on the papacy? I would very much love to meet with <laughs> the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church uh, for a dialogue on eschatology. That he should recognize that the Great War is coming. For me, it's important. He did not refer to it as Armageddon, so I'd like to ask him whether you are referring to Armageddon. And if you are, then what follows after that? And how should we respond to Armageddon? We need to have Christian, Muslim, Jewish dialogue, not just on what is similar between our religions and what is different, but more importantly, a, a dialogue on eschatology, on the end time. I am perhaps one of the, if you will excuse it, the, one of the leading scholars in the world of Islam today, and this is not in any boasting way. Uh, we have several books which have been written, and I'm just completing now a new book on the Antichrist, the Quran, and the beginning of, beginning of history. And after this will come another book on the Antichrist, the Quran in the end of history, and then another book on from Jesus, the true Messiah, to the Antichrist, the false Messiah. So I am literally pioneering Islamic eschatology, and it's a time for us to dialogue. Dialogue. If I can meet with the Pope or with his representatives uh, for the Catholic Church, the Protestants, the Orthodox Christians, and dialogue on the subject, it would be fascinating. Isn't there the, the way of religious life, the, um, how shall we say, the uh, necessary in order to prepare us for the life thereafter, 
So is that the, the protection of the reader's life, a protection of our eternal uh, life, in, in a way. So the threat from the other side is obviously from the enemy that tries to, you know, be, stand between us and salvation. Yes, the religious way of life is important. And those who are priests and rabbis and imams and scholars and who live a life of piety, we, these are the beacons, these are the luminaries of the world today. I remember when I was in secondary school, my father chose the most important college in the country in Trinidad, a secular institution. And I should have been happy to be in the most important college in the country. I remember at the age of 14 asking my father, can you transfer me to the Roman Catholic College in my own town? Because there was a natural attraction to the priest who lived the religious way of life. I didn't have that in that major college of the country. So the priest who is a pious person and who lives the religious way of life can transform those who are around him, transform the world. But today there is corruption. You have the Islamic scholars who are being paid to do all kinds of wrong things. And you have the Christian priests who are an embarrassment to the Christian church. And there are rabbis also like that. So we, if we look for those who are authentically living the religious way of life in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Islam. And these people come together, not the rotten apples. How do we spot them, that they are the right ones and the other ones, the rotten apples? Those who truly live the religious way of life would have light. In Arabic, the word is nur, light. There'll be light in their hearts and there'll be light in the face. You can't buy that light in the supermarket. No. It's fading away today. Those who control the political world are people with only darkness. Those who control the market have only darkness on their faces. Those who control the banking system only darkness on their face. But when you have eyes with which you can see, you can recognize someone who has light who walks with purity. When Jesus comes back, you will see light walking on the road. Pure, pure, pure light when Jesus comes back. Yeah, And we look forward to that day in the world of Islam. Let's talk for a minute about uh, the, the end times. And uh, if we're talking about Armageddon. So um, how is... Why is this so important that we speak about the end times? You know, because Jesus, for example, in the Bible spoke that we're living in the last days already. And this is 3,000 years ago. So end times and Armageddon, uh, when are the end times? Uh, what, what, uh, what do we have to discuss, in your opinion, about the end times? From the perspective of Islam, something that no Muslim can differ with is that the most important event remaining to occur in history is the return of the Son of Mary, the Virgin Mary, Jesus. Allah's blessing be upon them all. But our Prophet has said that before Jesus returns, the Antichrist will seek to impersonate him. What we are living through now is an effort by the Antichrist to prepare himself for that moment when he's going to appear in person and then from Jerusalem proclaim himself to be the Messiah. But he would not be the Messiah. He would be the false Messiah. But in order for him to convince those who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, to convince them that he is the Messiah, he will have to do a number of things. Number one, he will have to liberate the Holy Land for them. Number two, he'll have to bring them back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own 
after 2,000 years. Number three, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and make the proclamation eventually that this is Holy Israel of Solomon and of David. And number four, most dangerous of all, for which he needs Armageddon, he needs Armageddon, is that that Israel must become the ruling state in the world, Pax Judaica. So we can now understand that Pax Britannica and Pax Americana were meant to pave the way for Pax Judaica. We are on the verge of that at this time. So when you refer to Pax uh, Americana and, and Pax uh, Britannia, is, is that um, the control over the monetary system? It's not just the control over the monetary system. It's that the control over money is part and parcel of the effort required to control the world, to rule the world. The holy state of Israel, of Solomon, our last blessing be upon him, was a ruling state. It's going to surprise your viewers now, what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's also going to uh, surprise the Muslims who have been reading the Quran, but not as yet been able to understand. That in the Quran, we are told that the Lord God, one day, caused something to happen to Solomon, which caused him distress. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ Suleiman. And when he saw what, it was probably a vision, he saw someone sitting on his throne. And he realized that this was an imposter who would one day seek to capture holy Israel. And he then made a prayer, which is in the Quran. He prayed to God for a holy Israel, la yambagi li ahadimim ba'di that no one after me will be able, it cannot belong to anyone after me, meaning the Antichrist. So he saw the Antichrist sitting on his throne. But the Quran refers to that person who was sitting on the throne as a, a being without a soul, a body without a soul. That's the Antichrist. We are now living through that moment in history when the effort to establish a holy state of Israel and declare it to be the state of Israel of Solomon and of David is about to climax, is about to climax. The Jew who is a Jew and who longs for truth would must, must recognize that this is a false Messiah that's coming. The Christian must recognize, of course, because the Christian believes that Jesus is the Messiah and so does the Muslim that this is a false messiah who is now seeking to control the world and who is using oppression, oppression in the monetary system, oppression in the banking system, oppression in the political system. And anyone who seeks to resist him is a terrorist. So now let's talk um, quickly about Jerusalem in the Quran. Uh, Jerusalem is perhaps an English word, or I don't know what language it is in Jerusalem, but the Arabic is uh, not Jerusalem. Uh, in the Arabic language, we, the Quran is sent in Arabic language, yeah. Um, it is Al-Quds, or Bayt al-Maqdis, the holy city, the holy city, yeah. And uh, there are several references in the Quran, but it's always covered. The Quran, for example, re referred to it as Al Ardul Muqaddasa, the Holy Land, the Holy Land, in which is located the city of Jerusalem. And uh, the Quran says, uh, Christian, you're going to be surprised when I tell you this. The Quran says that the Holy Land was given to the Israelite people, to the Jews. And I often wonder why is it not posted in bold black letters in the New York Times. The, the Quran says the Holy Land was given to the Jews. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A Christian, you're going to be surprised. The reason why they don't do it is because the Quran goes on to explain 
that holy Jerusalem and the holy land was given conditionally. Conditionally. That you have to be righteous in conduct and you have to be worshipping the one God. Don't tell any lies about him. Hmm? If you say you are the chosen people of the Lord God, to the exclusion of all the rest of mankind, I'm quoting for you the Quran. If you believe that you are the chosen people of the Lord God, the people who are the elect of the Lord God, to the exclusion of all the rest of mankind, the Quran says, well, why don't you desire death if you are truthful? If you believe, says the Quran, that heaven is reserved for you to the exclusion of all the rest of mankind, you are the only ones for heaven, well, why don't you desire death if you are indeed truthful? But this is false. This is false. All human beings will stand before the Lord God on judgment day as equal in his sight as are the teeth of a comb. The white, the black, the brown, the yellow, none can claim superiority over another. Superiority is based on conduct. If you are righteous in your conduct, if you stand up for justice, you are superior before the Lord God. And if you are an oppressor, hmm? Jerusalem and the Holy Land, which is Israel today, is where the final struggle is taking place. And history will conclude with the triumph of truth over falsehood and justice over injustice and oppression. That is our eschatology. Now, in conclusion, um, go back to the Catholic Church and the uh, Islamic faith. Um, are there any, how do we should get together? What, what, what would you suggest to uh, fight this together, to bring all, you know, believers that believe in, in God together and, and what? Is there a plan that you have? We maybe... There are lots of rotten apples. Yeah. Christian, there are lots of rotten apples in the world today. We got rotten apples in the world of Islam. You got rotten apples in the world of Christianity. They got rotten apples in Judaism. There are lots of rotten apples in Africa and in India and in China. We have to try to separate those who are indeed pure from those who are not. And the Roman Catholic priest and scholar who is living purity, living the life of integrity, and who has been blessed with light. This is the man who we should reach out to in the Roman Catholic Church. Such a man will be able to recognize the oppressor and recognize oppression and recognize the history of oppression on Africa, for example. The history of oppression in the United States where slavery is still around and thriving in the United States because the slave master is still a slave master. And you have to be blind not to see that the slaves in America are still slaves today. Just look at the economy and it'll tell you. So you have to look for such people in the Roman Catholic Church. Look for such people in Jewish religion and in Islam. These are the ones who must come together not the rotten apples. And they must dialogue with each other. I have much to learn from the Christian faith. I have much to learn from Christian eschatology, yes. And for me, it's a joy, a pleasure to meet with a monk, to meet with a priest who is living the religious way of life, to benefit from his company. I think this is the kind of dialogue, not the establishment. The establishment has been taken over and is being taken for a ride. Now we've got to look for the, the ones who truly live the religious way of life. And these must come together. And I'm grateful to you, Christian, for this opportunity to share with you these views, which I hope will now reach to the Roman Catholic Church wherever this program is viewed, and that they may respond positively. I thank you also. I learned a lot through your teachings as well, you know, being Catholic and uh, listening to your, to your television programs. I think we all could use more, um, you know, learning and listening to other teachers 
that are outside of our own religion in order to understand the religion better and understand what we have in common and then you know together do something about the world that is completely opposed to this. Thank you so much Imran for being here with us today, taking your time and um, yeah, uh, hope you know to see you soon on your program. Thank you Christian. Thank you. God bless you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, we return now. I hope that you enjoy that uh, interview with uh, Christian Pesh Peshken at the uh, Palais des Nations in uh, uh, the United Nations in Geneva, uh, conducted on behalf of the Roman Catholic Broadcasting Network. Mm. And uh, now we will devote uh, for a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, today, to introduce what is money in Islam and I believe that the Christian, the Jew, the Hindu, maybe the Buddhist as well who listens to what I have to say pertaining to Islam would find but there's much in common we have the same views that you have if we do have the same views then why can't we come together to do something about it what then is money in Islam I want to begin with an event. Uh, uh, incidentally, I need to teach the subject in such a way that I can hope to convince the scholars of Islam that they may also now assume the courage to come out and start teaching the subject as well because they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So let us begin with Allah's blessed name and pray that he may bless this effort that we may be able to explain the subject authentically, correctly, and easily. Here is an event which occurred in the life of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. A companion of his, Bilal was his name, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, came to him and offered him some dates. He looked at the dates and he said, Bilal, these are high quality dates. Oh yes, they are different qualities. I just came back a few days ago, two, uh, two three days ago, and I brought with me to Trinidad two boxes of dates from Algeria. And they were fresh dates brought from Algeria to France to Geneva, and then I brought them home, and they're very, very, very sweet. So they are high quality dates, and they are dates which don't have that same high quality. So he said, Bilal, these are high quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two sa'a, which let us use modern weights and measures, say two kilograms, two kilos, if you'll allow me. I had two kilos of inferior quality dates. Maybe they were worth maybe five dollars each or three dollars each. So a total of six dollars. And I exchanged them for this one kilogram of superior quality dates, which is worth about the same six dollars. So in value, the chain exchange was okay because these were worth about the same as this. But these were two kilograms and this was one. And it was dates. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, Bilal, Bilal, this is the essence of riba or usury which is prohibited 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 in, in the quran prohibited in the bible prohibited so vehemently that the very last revelation that came down in the quran was on the subject of riba or usury and in that revelation allah declared war for those who persist in riba, he says, فَأَذَنُوا 
بِحَرْبِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ Then take notice of a declaration of war from Allah and from His Messenger. There is no other, no other part of the Quran where there is such a, def, such a very strong response as this. War from Allah and His Messenger for those who are engaged in riba or usury. Uh, Bilal, this is the essence of riba or usury. One form of usury is to lend money on interest. That I give you a hundred dollars and you return two hundred. So it's a loan on a hundred percent interest. Hmm? Uh, this is one form of riba, to lend money on interest. And it's prohibited in Islam. And uh, the Prophet, alayhi salatu Islam, he cursed Yes, he cursed all four. And he said they're all equally guilty. The one who takes riba, he lends his money on interest or he puts his money in a fixed deposit. So he's a money lender and he's taking the interest. Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, cursed him. And the one who gives riba, the one who borrows money on interest and he pays back the capital sum with interest. Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam cursed him. And he cursed the one who records the transaction, the administration. And he cursed the witnesses, the two witnesses. And he said they're all equally guilty. If the curse of a prophet is upon someone, he can pray as much as he wants, it's not going anywhere. He can fast in Ramadan, it's not going anywhere. He can go perform his Hajj, it's not going to be accepted. No, <laughs> not if you have the curse of a prophet upon you. And this is one form of riba or usury, lending or borrowing money on interest. Bilal, he said, this is the essence of riba. But riba has a different form as well. It is a transaction based on deception in which you rip off people. You rip them off. Hmm? The prophet said, if you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, maybe a truckload of watermelons, and the price in the market for wholesale price for watermelon, say $3 a pound or $3 a kilo, and you meet him outside of the market. He does not know what is the market price. And you offer to buy his truckload of watermelons from him. But when he enters into the market after having sold the watermelons to you, he finds out that he could have gotten a better price in the market. You ripped him off. You exploited his ignorance of the market price. He wouldn't want to ever do business with you again. He probably wouldn't even want to shake hands with you again. The prophet said, this also is riba. Oh, you sorry. A transaction based on deception, which yields a profit or a gain to which one is not justly entitled. You sorry. Oh, riba. So the Prophet said to Bilal, Bilal, this is the essence of riba. By exchanging two kilograms of inferior quality dates for one kilogram of superior quality dates, this was the essence of riba and this was haram. It was not kosher. It was prohibited. What you should have done, said the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, was to sell the two kilograms of inferior quality dates. And you get that six dollars or whatever it was, six dirhams. And you take that money and you buy the one kilogram of superior quality dates. That's halal. That's okay. No riba. No usury. But an unequal exchange of dates was riba, was usury, was haram, was prohibited. 
واي واي عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه exchange one camel for four an unequal exchange of camels but that was not riba it was not haram it was not usury it was okay it was a valid transaction you could exchange animals camels for camels unequal but you cannot exchange dates in an unequal exchange why we ask the question why well i have news for you <laughs> one of the signs of the last day is that knowledge will disappear from the world knowledge will go i asked this question at darul ulum zakaria in johannesburg the entire staff the principal and 700 students from about 70 different countries were all gathered for that lecture and i said can anyone tell me why no one could answer it. no one this is an islamic seminary producing scholars a hundred years ago even a schoolboy would be able to answer the question why is it that an unequal exchange of dates was haram was usury or riba but an unequal exchange of camels was a valid transaction not haram a hundred years ago even a schoolboy would be able to answer that question but today because of man's massive brainwashing massive brainwashing to the new educational system and so on Nobody can answer that question today. In French, the, I've learned the term in French is called lavage de cerveau. <laughs> Brain, brainwashing, that's what it is. Now, our, our effort will be now to explain why was it prohibited, haram, riba or usury, to have an unequal exchange of dates. But it was not haram, it was valid to have an unequal exchange of camels. Let us now attempt to explain that. And in the process of doing so, we will be able to introduce you to what is money in Islam. We will pause here and uh, we come back to the subject next week. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.